So good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, so nice to see so many smiling faces in the audience, or just all of you. So thank you for joining us in person. Um, and thank you to all of you joining us online uh, remotely for our second to last presentation of 2021. My name is Korienko. I am the assistant curator here at the Draper Naturalist Museum. Uh, Nathan Dorr, the curator of the Draper, is back upstairs and running the show here um, for all of our online folks. So thank you to Nathan for uh, keeping us in, in touch here. Um, and he's also going to be fielding questions from our online audience, so a huge thank you. Uh, quick announcement, um, please silence or turn off your cell phone or electronic devices. Um, we just want to take a quick minute here to thank our sponsors, uh, Sage Creek Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. Uh, that make all of our lunchtime expeditions, uh, Draper After Dark public programming available and free of charge. So a huge uh, shout out to our sponsors there. We also want to thank all of you for the taking time out of your busy schedules to come in person or to join online um, and make this a special event. So these lectures are being recorded and they're going to be uploaded to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous speakers from this year or the past few years, you can just go to youtube.com, type in Draper Natural History Museum, look for the bear icon, and uh, you'll see a list of their and playlists of all our different uh, lunchtime expedition presentations. Um, if you'd like to be added to our email list uh, for any upcoming presentations or programming, um, please come find me after the talk. I'll get your name, we'll write down, get an email for you. Um, and then for the next announcement, um, you'll, get a, you'll get a notification. Um, we are starting to schedule speakers for 2022. And unless anything changes, we will continue to host live audiences in the co-auditorium. So invite your friends, invite family to attend in person as you feel comfortable. So today we're going to hear from Mr. Brian Bove, curator of the Park County Archives here in Cody. Bove holds a Master of Arts degree in history and is currently working towards a Master of Library Science degree. Bove is also a member of the Park County Historic Preservation Commission and the Park County Historical Society. Bove is a meticulous researcher whose keen attention to detail and interest in local history often involves sifting through archival records and periodicals, as well as exploratory trips off the beaten path to validate many of these difficult to access historical sites throughout Park County. Perhaps it comes as no surprise that Bove spends his free time exploring the historical geography of Park County to better understand and recount the unfrequented stories that endure throughout our local landscape. So without further ado, please give Brian Bove a warm welcome. Thanks for coming to this. Um, I hope you're as excited to talk about grizzled prospectors and remote mining claims as I am. Um, my name is Brian Bove, and I'm the curator of the Park County Archives here in Cody, which means I love local history and studying local history, and it's my job to preserve Park County history and help people, the public, learn about their local Park County history. And I wanted to talk today about mining because it's sort of an off-the-beaten-path uh, topic that certainly was a, an important part of our early history here in Park County, but it can be really difficult to access. It's not like driving down Sheridan Avenue and, and looking at all the historic buildings. And I got interested in this topic because probably like a lot of you, I like to go hiking up in the mountains, and invariably I would find a uh, cabin like this one, and I would think to myself, who the heck was up here doing this and what were they doing? Or I'd be hiking up a trail and I'd think, why is this trail even here? Why did someone go to all this effort to, to punch a trail through nasty, rugged terrain? And when I asked myself this stuff, I realized that I need to learn a lot more about our local mining history. So here we are, talking about, talking about mining, and we're specifically going to talk about our local hard rock mining, precious metals, not coal or sulfur or oil. That's certainly an important part, but it's a massive topic, and we just don't have time to do that. So quickly to just lay out this presentation, I want to talk briefly about mining in the American West, just to give context for our, lo our local history. And then we're going to talk about early prospecting in the Absorcas, 
and I'll try to define some mining terms, and then we'll address the exhilarating world of late 19th century mining economics. And then we'll go through the histories of various mining districts in Park County. We'll just cover the big ones. We don't have time to cover every single, we don't have time to cover the, the Crouch Mines on Eagle Creek or, or the Chat Fields on Kitty Creek. And I'm, what I'm not gonna talk about too much today is geology, mainly because I am completely unqualified to do that. Obviously, geology is an important part of this, so I'll, I'll do my best to include the very little geology that I understand. But this is, this is gonna be a history presentation, not a, not a geology presentation. We may not always think about it all the time, but mining has played a very important part in American history. Now, Native Americans have been, had mine, have been mining minerals for, for thousands of years. Think of Aztec gold or using copper to make tools or mining, mining turquoise or other stones for jewelry, but they largely kept their relationship with metals pretty, pretty casual. It didn't totally upend their population dynamics. For Americans, uh, mining was a major driver of Western expansion and settlement into new areas. And I think you all know how this got started. In 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in California, and it set off a gold rush that changed the entire American landscape. All of a sudden, you have a wagon route going across the interior of the continent, and railroads racing to access new markets. And you have this large population completely transplant itself uh, into a new place. And from there, they, they, they keep moving around. Although many people flock to these gold rushes, only a small handful ever make any meaningful money. So everyone else is just stuck doing the, the grimy, hard, physical labor and danger, working in dangerous environments and living these lonely, desolate lives. So they invariably move on to, to better things. And every time a new strike is made, people quickly rush in, and then the overflowing population spreads out into the nearby mountains to look for better things. So after the California gold rush, we have a nearby, the nearby Nevada silver boom in 1858 with the Comstock load, and then some miners moving back east across the continent in 1858 also discover gold in Colorado, which starts the Colorado gold rush, and miners moving north out of California and Nevada start numerous smaller mining booms up in Idaho, and then in 1862, gold is discovered in Bannock, Montana, and then again in 1863 near Virginia City, starting the Bozeman Trail and the Bridger Trail across Wyoming, so miners can get up to Montana. Then closer to home, we have the smaller South Pass Gold Rush down at Miner's Delight in Atlantic City in 1867, and then finally the Black Hills Gold Rush in 1874, and that increases throughout that decade. And by plotting out some of these Western mining booms, I'm hoping to make the point that in the Western United States in the second half of the 19th century, there's, there's kind of this, this, this mining boom culture where the population is perpetually unstable, it's restless, it's constantly moving around to try to be in the right place for that next big strike. And you can see that Wyoming is kind of right here in the epicenter of all this. Now, Wyoming never had a, a big mining boom like neighboring states. The South Pass Gold Rush was a pretty small thing, relatively. But miners are moving into our neighboring states, and then they're coming into Wyoming. And we'll probably never know who the first prospectors were to come into the Absorcas. There are probably numerous small groups that we will never be able to know anything about just because they didn't leave any, any records. But the earliest reference I can find to miners in the Absorcas was in 1854. According to a story, there were, there were California miners heading back east across the continent, prospecting the, the interior mountains. Uh, and details are always kind of hazy about this sort of stuff. 
but apparently they are prospecting the, the headwaters of the Stinking Water, later renamed Schoen River, and up in the Clark's Fork, where they found some good prospects, and then they built a stockade to protect themselves from Indian attack. And this was all, this was, this was still very much Indian territory. It was a very dangerous place to be. And as the end of the season came about, they were leaving the mountains, and they were in fact, oh sorry, they were in fact killed by Indians out here in the basin, which was one of the reasons why we don't know very much about these folks, because uh, they, were, they didn't talk to anyone. The only reason why we know they even existed was a diary that was later found at the site of the attack. Now, an anonymous miner tells the story that in 1871, he and a party of fellow prospectors uh, went up probably what was the north fork of Crandall Creek. He calls it the right-hand fork, but when you're looking up the creek, it's to the north. And they found the remains of an old cabin already in 1871, which is pretty early for around here, and the evidence of a major ground sluicing operation, which was the old California style of, of gold mining. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of what ground sluicing looks like, but uh, it's an environmentally devastating way to mine, where instead of, you build, instead of building nice tight sluice boxes, you build a crude canal, and then you're just running water over an entire section of the landscape, uh, essentially just eroding it really quickly, and then you look down in all those natural crevices and try to pan out concentrated gold. It's a very sloppy way to look, for, to look for minerals. My point with all this hazy history is that we just don't know the crazy things that people were doing in these mountains over the years. They could have been doing all kinds of, all kinds of major um, environmental stuff, we, but nature has just erased the evidence. But the first mining expedition that we actually have evidence for was that of James Stewart, who was an early pioneer and miner in southwest Montana. In 1863, he, he brings a group of Montana miners to go prospecting along the Yellowstone and up the Bighorn Rivers. And the whole thing is a, is a complete disaster. They get attacked by Indians. Some guys die. Another guy shoots him, accidentally shoots himself in the shoulder. He dies. Um, it just wasn't a good trip. So the next year, they came across the, uh, the Absorcas into the North Fork of the Stinking Water. But the problem with going this way is there's too much snow to actually do any prospecting. So some of these guys are really grumpy and they go back to Montana. Other ones just stick it out. And again, a few of these people get killed by Indians. After all, they are trespassing on Indian land. And as callous as this sounds, that was just the, the risk these guys knew they were taking. Um, because as we know, money, or even just the prospect of money, makes people engage in, in risky behavior. The next organized mining party to come around here was in 1866, when a group of 100 miners from Montana again came down to prospect the Stinking Water, the Gray Bull, the, the Upper Wind River, and they elected Mr. Jeff Standifer as their captain, and a guy named Bart Henderson as their lieutenant, and also on this trip was another guy named Jack Baronet. And remember those names because they'll come back around. And they came into the basin from the north and just prospected all of these streams on the eastern side of the Absorcas. And they didn't really find all that much, but this trip is important because it really gets people in the, the prospecting community familiar with the Absorcas and what might later be found there. And the last big party we need to address was the Bighorn Expedition of 1870, which started as a group of mostly Colorado miners who wanted to go prospect up in Wyoming, up in Indian Territory, and they organized down in Cheyenne. And this was a, a really big deal back then. There were, there were uh, notices and papers across the Midwest and in Rocky Mountain states calling on people to join this group this group and go find these undiscovered riches. Judge William uh, Kuykendall was elected to lead the group and he was an ex-Confederate who came west after the Civil War. 
They originally wanted to go up and prospect the Bighorn Mountains and the Black Hills. The problem with this, the big problem with this, is this is Sioux territory, and they really don't take kindly to white folks encroaching on their land. So everyone knew there was going to be trouble. So President Grant gets involved, and he says, Koikendal or Kaikendal, however you pronounce your silly name, you're Confederate scum. This Indian thing is already a touchy situation. You're not going to go up there and make it even worse. You're banned from going to the Bighorns or the Black Hills. So instead, you, you have all these miners down in Cheyenne ready to go, and they need to, need to go somewhere. They instead go up the Wind River and into the basin from the south. And they do find some gold on Wood River. They find some what's called floating gold, what they call floating gold on the Stinking Water and on the Clark's Fork River, but apparently not enough to hold their attention because, again, some of these guys are grumpy. Some of them go back to Cheyenne. Some of them head up to Montana. Now, also in 1870, while the Bighorn Expedition is in the basin along the east side of the mountains, there was another smaller group of less organized guys who were coming into the mountains from the west. And this was a ragtag group of prospectors, Adam Horn Miller, James Gorley, Ed Hibbert, and also Bart Henderson, which you, if you remember, he was on that 1866 Standifer trip. And they came up the Yellowstone River from Montana and up the Lamar into this mess of mountains up here from the Clark's Fork down to the headwaters of the North Fork. Roughly around Hoodoo Basin, where uh, the, the headwaters of the Lamar River and Crandall Creek and the North Fork of the Stinking Water and the South Fork of the Clark's Fork River, later, later renamed Sunlight Creek, all sort of meet. And you can probably guess what happens to them. They get attacked by Indians and all their horses are stolen, but they do make it back to Montana and they come back into Wyoming uh, a short time later and start laying claims in these mountains. And these guys are really the first generation of prospectors to thoroughly explore the Absorcas and start locating mineral claims. Perhaps their most valuable find are in the mountains just north of the border in, uh, in the Cook City area. And Horn Miller and Bart Henderson are basically the founders of that mining camp. And this is a, a map of all the claims around Cook City down here. And you can see that most of them are up here to the north around Henderson Mountain. And they're pulling out gold and silver and copper and lead ore, which is basically true for all the mines in the Absorcas. It's mostly silver and copper. Sometimes there's a little bit of lead. Sometimes there's a little bit of gold. And we're not going to talk too much about Cook City because it'll take us on a rabbit hole from which we'll never be able to escape. But uh, it is the first notable find in the area. And as we've talked about before, this causes a bunch of folks to rush in, and then they, they subsequently scatter out into the mountains. One of those guys is Jack Crandall. I, I'm assuming that a lot of you are familiar with the, with the gruesome story about Jack Crandall, but I feel like I'm contractually obligated to recount it here. So the story is, in 1870, Jack Crandall and his partner, named either Doherty or Finley, depending on what source you're looking at, are, are prospecting the upper Clark's Fork area. And these guys are contemporaries of Horn Miller and Bart Henderson. They all knew each other. Anyway, Crandall and his partner are camped along a tributary of the Clark's Fork when they are ambushed by Indians, and they're decapitated, and their heads are stuck on their pickaxes in the ground. And their remains are, are found the next year by a group of prospectors, hence the name Crandall's Creek. Now in, 18, in the 18, 1920s, local newspaper publisher, author, um, journalist, Carolyn Lockhart paid for this bronze plaque to be put on a large stone at Jack Crandall's campsite where he was buried. And apparently this, th this thing is still there, um, but I haven't seen it because it's on private property. If anyone has an in, let me know. And then there's John Hughes, who, whose nickname was Dad. 
Uh, a lot of times he's just referred to as, as dad use. And he's gonna help us transition into talking about the Sunlight Mining District. Now, Horn Miller and Bart Henderson are the real discoverers of, of the minerals up here, but they get caught up with things up in Cook City, and, and then other guys move into these mountains around Sunlight Peak, around Stinking Water Peak, and start prospecting, and one of those guys is, is Dad Hughes. Unfortunately, I've never seen a picture of, of Dad Hughes, but um, his name is still on the landscape because Hughes Basin, right here at the headwaters of the North Fork, Hughes Creek, is named after Dad Hughes. And Dad Hughes was one of those miners who just seemed to drift around everywhere. Uh, in the 1860s, he was mining down in Nevada, and then he came up to Montana, and then he came up in sunlight in Wyoming, and after he got out of sunlight, he went up to the Yukon during that gold rush, and then he came back to Wyoming, and he did some prospecting up around Kerwin. But sometime in the 1880s, he finds his way to upper sunlight and starts locating mineral claims. So oh, this is a picture of, of Hughes Basin looking down into the North Fork from the, from the divide. And I realize it might be helpful at this point to uh, unpack or, or excavate some, some of these uh, mining terms. What is a load? What is a claim? Okay, a load is usually a, a vein of minerals that's embedded in solid rock. So it has well-defined boundaries. And in order to mine this stuff, you need to follow wherever that vein might go. So, so when miner, miners are excavating an adit or a shaft, they're, they're usually following a load. And just to be clear, an adit is a, a horizontal mining tunnel, a shaft is a vertical mining tunnel. And I don't suggest you go in either one of those. Now, a load isn't pure mineral. Uh, it's often embedded into the rock. So if you're a miner, you're not just pulling out big chunks of gold and silver. You have to pull out ore, which is then processed in a smelter to separate the valuable minerals from the rest of the rock. In 1893, a young geologist named Thomas Jagger visited Sunlight Creek with a, a larger US geological expedition. And he noted all of these dikes and veins present in up, up Sunlight Creek and over in the North Fork. And these are really good indications of where you might find mineral loads. So mineral loads are usually way up in the mountains, whereas mines down in valleys along stream beds are usually placer mines. Don't say placer, it's pronounced placer. It's from the Spanish word for, for a river bank or a stream bed. And this is where minerals have eroded from uh, the ore and scattered about in amongst sand and, and gravel down at the bottom of a, of a drainage. And placer mining can run anywhere from just panning for gold like this guy or running a sluice box where you just put gravel in this little box and then run water through it to separate it or massive earth moving operations that entirely alter the landscape. And we've had a few placer mines around Park County over the years. There was one at the mouth of the Clarks Fork Canyon. There's also one between Cody and Powell back in the 1890s. Okay, let's talk about mining claims. A claim is a parcel of land on which a prospector or a miner uh, has asserted the right to develop and extract a mineral deposit. And according to the general United States mining law of 1872, I know you'll, you all have it memorized, but any US citizen or someone who has declared their intention of becoming a citizen can locate and hold a mining claim on public domain land that is open to mineral entry. And they, that claim continues to exist as long as they keep paying the annual maintenance fee or they keep performing mining work on that claim. And this is a map of all the old claims up in, up in Cook City most of which have long been abandoned. Now, when you have a mining claim, it's not your private property. It's essentially a lease from the government to extract minerals, but no actual land ownership exists. And in order to prove up 
and, and get that prop, private property, you have to demonstrate that you can earn a living from the minerals off of that claim. And as soon as you're able to prove up or prove you can make money, that claim is then patented, which is when the government passes title to you uh, as owner of that, that land, making it private property. So it's kind of like a homestead, but instead of agricultural development, you're talking about mining development. So on a patented claim, you own the land as well as the minerals. On an unpatented claim, you only own the right to do mining work on public domain land. Today, you can still go out and, and file mining claims on BLM or national forest land, but in 1994, Congress imposed a moratorium on processing patent applications, so you can no longer turn your claim into private property. So this is a map of the Sunlight Mining District, and unfortunately it doesn't show every individual claim, uh, but you can see that basically the entire mountain range between the North Fork over here and Sunlight Creek is covered with, with, with mining claims. Dad Hughes was not the only prospector up there in sunlight back in the 18, late 1800s. Uh, there were numerous other guys and gals, many of which became homesteaders up in Sunlight Basin. Sunlight was originally called the Telluride Mining District, and the place was covered with hundreds of mining claims, only a few of which were ever actually patented, as the map shows. There's a few up Sunlight Creek over here in Silvertip Basin. There's one up Galena Creek. And a few, only a few of these are ever patented because, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, mining is just really, really hard work. And although there's all these prospectors in the area, they're usually not the ones doing the actual mining work because the ore around the Absorcas is what's called low grade, which means you get, need to get a lot of it out in order to get a paying amount of minerals. So a dude with a pickaxe really can't do the meaningful work it takes to get ore out and, and patent that claim. It's just beyond his abilities. And that brings us to the business of mining, which to my mind is one of the more fascinating parts of this. There's a very subtle difference between a prospector and a miner. Those terms should not be used interchangeably. A prospector goes out and actually locates where min minerals are found and then files a mining claim. He usually doesn't do too much mining work. Um, he might have to do some in order to have something to show for himself. But because he or she doesn't actually make money from mining minerals, it has to come from somewhere, and the money they usually make usually comes from their ability to drum up interest in the potential untapped wealth of their claims and the subsequent sale of those claims to a mining company. The mining company then tries to drum up interest among investors to do development work um, and get some ore out of the ground and hopefully patent those claims, turning them into private property. And the mining companies employ contract miners to do this dirty mining work. And I want to stress that this whole system depends on hype. The hype uh, prospectors hyping up their claims to companies, and then companies hyping up their minds to investors. So when you read an old source that a mine in Sunlight or a mine in Kerwin was just the biggest mineral discovery ever made, just relax. Because that, that language is just part of this system. So going back to Dad Hughes, the prospector, who's up in, in Sunlight and the North Fork, he and other prospectors have all these claims. Not much is really going on. But then in 1895, Mr. John Painter comes west on a hunting trip with some buddies. Mr. Painter is from Philadelphia, where he's in the business of importing Swiss musical boxes. Apparently, that was lucrative back then. And he and his friends are hunting up Crandall Creek and Sunlight Creek. And they must have run into some of these prospectors who sell them on the idea of these, these mining claims. And Painter just swallows this hype hook, line, and sinker. He buys the claims of, of Dad Hughes, 
and the others in the area, and he files some of his own claims, and he starts the Sunlight Copper Mining Company. And as a businessman from Philadelphia, he has good connections to East Coast capital. He brings in more investors, which in this case is arguably more important than knowing anything about mining. And he moves his family out to sunlight on a ranch that they homestead, and he focuses his time and energy on, on mining. So the obvious problem with this is logistics. This is just such a remote area and whatever ore you were able to get out is basically worthless because it's all eaten up. Any profit you have is eaten up by transportation costs. Painter and his company put a, put a road up Sunlight Creek right here. They have mines on Galena Creek and over here in Silvertip Basin. This is a picture down Galena Creek. Their mine was kind of right down here. This is used basin again, and you can see the trail that goes over this divide into Silvertip. And all this development work requires a place to house miners, so they, they, they build a few cabins at Lee City, which isn't much of a city if you've ever been up there. There's also the Painter Cabin, which is still, still there. And for all this work, the Sunlight Copper Mining Company doesn't actually get all that much ore out of the mines. They get some just to show potential, but it's cost prohibitive to get all that much. The mining development they do perform is basically to lure investors to finance a railroad up, the, up near the mines. Now, despite what old sources say, Obviously, a railroad never materialized, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. But because the railroad never arrives, the whole scheme sort of fizzles, fizzles away. Work stops completely in 1904. John Painter moves to Idaho to do some mining over there. And he moves out of Wyoming, one, because his mines fail, and also because He's having an affair with Carolyn Lockhart, and his family kind of tells him to get lost. So it wasn't, it wasn't all about the mines. <laughs> the other important mining operation in the Sunlight District was over in, in Sulphur Creek. And the first person that we know about who was working this area was an old mountain man named Jack Baronet. And again, this guy had a wild life. Uh, he was, remember, he was on the 1866 Standifer expedition. He was born in Scotland. He kind of sailed around the world for a while until he ended up in California to participate in the gold rush there. And then in 1864, he came up to Montana and got involved in the mining scene, the backwoods scene around Yellowstone and in the Absorcas. And you might recognize his name because when you drive in the northeast entrance, there's this big mountain to the northeast, uh, northwest side of the road, which is called Baronet Creek. And it's spelled differently, that's just because people didn't care about spelling back then. Now, Baronet does some mining work up Sulphur Creek in the 1890s, and he builds a camp about a mile up the creek, and the ruins are still up there if you make it up that way. And it seems that, that Baronet abandons this operation sometime around 1897, but some of his, his associates stick around, one of them being Wade McClung, who located a few good prospects way at the head of Sulphur Creek. And in 1904, McClung sells these claims to the Winona Gold and Copper Mining and Milling Company, which is a company of Colorado men who pour a lot of money into developing this operation, but not in developing a good name for their company. And they have about 21 mining claims, some purchased, some filed by the company and they build a camp further up the creek from the old baronet place, which uh, is still up there, if you go up there. They haul a big generator and boiler to wire the place with power, which is a pretty big operation to supply power way up in the mountains, away from anywhere. And above the camp, they excavate a couple of, of tunnels on the Greenhorn claim. There's a shorter tunnel 
It's a good picture. You can see they have little carts on these tracks. One way they dump the valuable ore, and the other way they just dump the worthless ore over this cliff here. Then they have a larger 700-foot tunnel following a vein of copper. And all this work is done by miners employed by the Winona Copper Mining Company who work and live up there a good part of the year. Obviously, they can't live up there in the middle of winter. There's just too much snow. So they have a good operation going, but again, logistics and transportation are, are a problem. The company sur surveys a narrow gauge railroad up the Clarks Fork Canyon and up Sunlight Creek and try to sell investors on this idea, but obviously a railroad never goes up there. It was just too big of an investment for, for an unguaranteed return. So unlike, just like John Painter's Sunlight Copper Mining Company, the Winona Mines fizzle out as well. Moving on to the South Fork, apparently mineral deposits were discovered here in the late 1870s around Needle Creek, but for whatever reason they sat unworked for, for about a decade until a Mr. Robert Dunham, an old Colorado turned Montana miner out of Red Lodge, starts pulling galena ore out of there. Galena is basically lead. There's a little bit of a little bit of silver sometimes, maybe a little bit of copper and zinc. And this soon gets some attention because in the 1890s the, the Burlington Railroad is talking about and actually surveying a, a railroad line up the South Fork, which is, is important in this, in this sense because if you've ever been up the South Fork beyond where the road ends, you know the trail gets really interesting. It hugs this ledge uh, above the canyon, and that's even after uh, blasting it out for over 100 years. So I don't know what it was even like in the 1890s. I don't want to think about it. So more prospectors move in and start making locations at what is then called the Elkhorn Camp. And one of these prospectors is a guy named Re from Red Lodge named John Davis. In 1891, Davis files a homestead around Cabin Creek, further down the South Fork River from the mines, and he'll later sell this ranch and it will become the Majo, which started out as a, a base of mining operations. Now, Davis is employed by a, a group of investors who are none other than the same guys who are working to found the town of Cody. Got Buffalo Bill here. This is his friend, White Beaver. You can see there's a... a tunnel entrance right there. Buffalo Bill, George Beck, Bronson Rumsey, George Blystein, you know all the streets. There's a few other guys. And they created the Shoshone Mining Company in 1896 to work these mines on the South Fork. The company essentially just paid John Davis to oversee all the work on these mines, and the investors would occasionally go out there and John Davis would, would show them what's up. This is John right here. This is Buffalo Bill. This is John again, Buffalo Bill. And Buffalo Bill and all of them could play the prospector because everyone loved to talk about how they were invested in a mine somewhere. It was all in good fun. Now, I think you probably know what I'm going to say. The Shoshone Mining Company got a little bit of good ore out, but not enough to make a profit. The railroad never came, despite everyone's hopes. But it wasn't a total loss, because Buffalo Bill and Beck and all those investors loved going up there and taking their friends up the South Fork and riding that fun trail, and basically using the mining camp as a hunting headquarters. So it wasn't a total loss. They eventually give up on mining in the area, and by the 19-teens, the old mining camp is already abandoned, and visiting hunters see the place and, and already look at it as a, a distant relic of the past. But that's not the end of the story about the mines in the South Fork, because in the early 1930s, a local prospector named Jess White took up the abandoned mining claims up Needle Creek and he apparently dismantled some of the ruin, old ruins of cabins 
the old Buffalo Bill cabins down here on the south side of the creek and reassembled them on the north side. And any remains of the uh, cabins down here burned up in a 1936 wildfire. And Jess and his wife, Mickey, built a few more cabins and made a nice little camp for themselves there. And they did some mining work, but uh, as some of you probably remember, they're, they're, they were a fixture of the Upper South Fork for many years, feeding hikers and hunters and, and horseback riders. And the white cabins are still up there, and they hopefully they will be for a long time. Over yet another mountain range from the South Fork, are the mines at Wood River, or Kerwin. And these are perhaps the best well-known, the most well-known because they're the most accessible and they are the best preserved. And if you remember, some of those early prospecting parties did find gold indications on Wood River, but it wasn't until the, about 1885 that a couple Colorado prospectors named Bill Kerwin and Henry Adams made the initial locations at the head of Wood River on Spar Mountain. And there's initially a lot of excitement. A flood of miners comes up from, come up from Mon, uh, Colorado, and a road is put up Wood River, and a town site is laid out in 1892. And in its heyday, Kerwin had a population of over 200 people, about 40 buildings, including a hotel, a boarding house for itinerant miners, a blacksmith shop, an assay office. And I've, I've, I've heard, seen it, I've seen it, I've read it, I've also heard it that, that Kerwin never had a saloon or a tavern, which maybe seems hard to believe considering that the population was over 200 people, but just remember that it's always been illegal to sell alcohol to minors. <laughs> With the railroad reaching uh, Cody in 1901, they, they haul in more machinery, and of course, they hope a railroad branch line will be built up there. But with the prospect of railroad transportation, some mining companies feel justified pouring more money into developing these prospects just to entice that railroad to get the heck up there. And this map shows a lot of the claims, and you can see that all the different companies kind of have different, different sections. There's the, the Silent Mining Company, Shoshone Mountain Company, the Wyoming Company, the Galena Ridge Company, the Gold Cliff up here. I'd also like to point out that there are load claims up in the mountains and then larger placer claims along the river. And as you all know, there's no railroad up to Kerwin. The camp limped along for a few years until in 1907 an avalanche killed some people. Also, it took out a good part of the town. And at that point, people just gave up. They walked away. It wasn't profitable to be up there anyways. And in retrospect, most of the mining work uh, was ill-advised and overly enthusiastic at Kerwin, probably also at the South Fork and in Sunlight, too. But everyone always had hope, hope that the railroad would come, that the next big strike was just a, a, a day's work away. And Hope can be exploited. A ways north of Kerwin, on the other side of Frank's Peak, is the gold reef mines, where four veins of, of gold-bearing ore emerged from the mountainside at the head of Jack's Creek. These claims were filed in 1894, but even at that early date, there was already a cabin ruin up there suggesting that someone, will never know who, had found that a long time ago. So from 1894 until 1914, the Gold Reef Mining Company employed a group of miners to, to work the Gold Reef. And the company was owned by, by various investors from Chicago who weren't really involved with the mining operation and most likely didn't know anything about mining. The Gold Reef mines weren't super accessible but the, the company did pay for a road to go up there, which gets you most of the way. My friend Corey and I hiked up there a couple years ago, and at the head of that cirque, there are still remains of the, uh, of the, uh, the old mining camp. 
And like all the old mining, around, mining operations around the Absorcas, the gold reef was never actually profitable, which begs the question, then why did work continue for some 20 years? It might have been because the company wanted to hold out long enough to try to sell the mines and make a profit that way. It also might have been because the actual miners were actively defrauding the investors in Chicago. And I want to give a shameless plug to a very interesting master's thesis by Andrew Mueller from Colorado State University. I don't know this guy, where he gives a great description of the history and archaeology of the gold reef. Uh, this is available online, or I can get you a copy if you're interested. And he makes a good argument that the gold reef mine was less about mining minerals and more about mining investors. Because the, the miners knew this was not going to be profitable. They're the ones up there looking at this ore every day. But they kept dangling the promise of enormous wealth uh, as bait so they can keep their jobs, keep getting a paycheck, without actually having to do all that much mining work. Because the investors are in Chicago, they're, they're not around, and you only have to show them some good-looking ore every now and again, and you keep dangling that carrot, and as a miner, you can, perf you can personally profit from the greed and, and vanity of some of these guys back east who love being able to tell their friends that they own a stake in a Wyoming gold mine who's gonna make, that's going to make them lavishly rich only in a couple years. And this is a great insight uh, when we're talking about the history of mining in the Absorcas. Because as I hope I've made clear, none of these mining operations were, were profitable. And there were a good number of reasons for that. Perhaps the most obvious being that the ore found in the Absorcas is low grade, which means you have to get a lot of it out to make a profit. And this requires expensive investments in transportation and processing that are really hard to justify. Also because the mining operations around here started relatively late compared to all those other mining booms that I talked about at the beginning. And they're just behind the curve. They're still undeveloped at a time when, when mineral prices are unpredictable and or declining. Now hold on to your hats, folks, because before we wrap things up, we need to address the salacious world of late 19th century US monetary policy and how it relates to mineral economics. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, there was this big political fight in the United States about free silver. That is, the ability to coin money from silver because this is a time of extreme booms and busts in the American economy. It's called the Gilded Age, so a lot of wealth is being created, but it's only kind of on the surface. The, the foundations of the economy are still pretty, pretty unstable. So in order to get a handle on this volatility, the US Treasury stops coining silver in 1873, putting, essentially just putting the country on the gold standard. And this is seen as a way to stabilize uh, the larger economy. But it also makes some people really, really mad. The mining industry in the West uh, hates this because they want the silver that they are mining to have value. And also, farmers in the South and in the West sort of, they want to see coining silver because they want to have inflation which they see will help them pay off their debts with a more abundant money supply. But bankers and industrialists don't want to see coining silver because they think inflation will lead to more instability and it will undermine the financial industry and foreign trade and all that fun stuff. So silver becomes this, this symbol of economic justice of the populist little guy against the entrenched fat cats. And this debate goes back and forth with some small victories for silver until in 1893, silver is fully demonetized by Congress, making the price of silver fall further than it already had. And the prospects for any new silver mining look pretty bleak. Wyoming's first two senators, Francis Warren and Joseph Carey, 
both voted against silver in the 1890s, and miners and small farmers and ranchers in Wyoming are absolutely livid about this. They, they hang these guys in effigy around the state as enemies of the West because silver prices fall and silver mining operations that might have been profitable a few years ago are, are now basically worthless. And this is at the same time when the various mines around Northwest Wyoming are starting to look for investors and trying to come on board. But at this point, there's still hope because as silver is losing value, uh, copper is becoming more valuable because the entire country is becoming electrified and copper wire is the standard wire conductor. And our local mining camps at Kerwin and it, up in sunlight are largely trying to ride that wave of, of good copper prices. The only problem with this is a place called Butte, Montana, which already had a healthy, healthy mining industry and massive copper deposits that were just ready to go. So miners in Butte flooded the market with copper, keeping demand in check and making the development of new mines in places like Park County, Wyoming, Kerwin and Sunlight, just unjustifiable from a financial perspective. If the mines in the Absorcas had been discovered a few decades earlier, or if silver or copper prices had, had remained high, then we might very well have a very different mountain environment around here. But because mining in the Absorcas missed that boom, they largely remained undeveloped. They mostly maintained their, their wilderness characteristics. And instead of becoming an industrial landscape crisscrossed with roads and dotted with development, they, have you ever been down to Colorado? Been up there? And the argument can certainly be made that one of the reasons why we have so much wilderness around here, there's certainly a lot of factors, but one of the reasons why we have so much wilderness around here is thanks to late 19th century US monetary policy and, and Butte, Montana, which sounds weird. So we never had a mining boom. We were just too late to the show and too remote. But Wyoming did have a boom, but Wyoming's booming industry was ranching and livestock and cowboys. And perhaps this helps explain why Wyoming just never underwent the amount of industrial development that its neighbors did, because Wyoming was just all about agriculture. And it took time before people realized that Wyoming did, in fact, have a lot of mineral wealth. It just wasn't the minerals that everyone had been looking for. Because what Wyoming lacked in gold and silver, they made up for in fossil fuels, which brought its own type of development. If you've ever been, just not in the mountains, if you've ever driven through Oregon Basin, you'll know what I'm talking about. But why, mining in, in Park County still has a good heritage because a lot of the early miners who came here became early settlers and, and homesteaders. They were just busted miners who were looking to make money on a mining boom. And when it all came to nothing, a lot of them left, but some of them stuck around and, and settled down on a nice piece of land and became dude ranchers or outfitters who utilized the undeveloped nature of the Absorcas in ways that were different from the pure resource extraction mindset of the mining industry. So whether you think that all of our failed mining camps around here are a historic misfortune, we just missed that, that economic opportunity, or if you think that, that uh, they're a wonderful blessing that we still have pristine mountains, that's up to you. But I hope from listening to this, whatever you think that you, that you do, did learn more about our local mountains and why they are the way they are today. So thank you, that's all I got. Corey.